Vision Edge gives you less eye strain and reduced damage caused by blue light. We like to call Vision Edge sunscreen for the eye. It all starts with your highest level of visual performance, only achievable through scientifically proven Vision Edge. Hello, and welcome to the Open Your Eyes podcast. I'm Dr. Kerry Gill, the host of the documentary, Open Your Eyes. Today, we're going to talk about contact lenses that help people with very poor eyesight. Eyesight that cannot be helped with glasses, regular contact lenses, or even surgery. Today's guest, Dr. Barry Iden, is an expert in designing and fitting of specialty contact lenses. Barry is an assistant clinical professor at the University of Illinois, Chicago, Department of Ophthalmology. He's the past chair of the contact lens and corneal section of the American Optometric Association. He's president and founder of the International Keratoconus Academy of Eye Care Professionals. He practices optometry in Deerfield, Illinois, in the Chicago land area. Barry, thank you for joining me today. It's my pleasure, Kerry. Well, let's get into it. What are specialty contact lenses? So, Kerry, specialty contact lenses are contacts that go beyond the simple correction of basic refractive error. What I mean by that is that these lenses basically correct more challenging cases than simple nearsightedness or astigmatism or even farsightedness. Typically, they're addressing most times medically uh, necessary indications for contact lenses like patients who suffer from certain corneal diseases, patients who suffer from trauma to the eye, or complications following eye surgery. Uh, my sister-in-law, who lives in Mexico, had LASIK a number of years ago. So she wants, her vision wasn't too bad after the LASIK, but she still was a little blurry, but certainly very, very good. So she wants to have an enhancement or another LASIK done. So she calls me up and says, I want to do this. So I said, send me your scans, your pictures. So they send me the pictures of her eye, the surgeon. I look at it and I said, don't do this. It's not a good idea to do this. But why listen to her brother-in-law? So she goes ahead and she does uh, a secondary LASIK, what we call an enhancement. And then after the enhancement, she has very, very poor vision. She has 2100 vision in one eye and she can only see fingers in the other eye. She can't take care of her children anymore. She can't work. She's crying all day and she calls the surgeon and she needs an answer. What could she do so she could see again? So they have no answer for her. Nobody could help her in Mexico. So she flies to New Jersey and asks if I could help her. So based on the scans that she sent me, I designed these gas permeable specialty contact lenses for her. She comes to my office, we put on the contact lenses, and she sees 2030. 2030 is in 2020, but it's a lot better than what she's seeing, where she can only see fingers in one eye and very poorly in the other eye. She's so happy that the tears are rolling down her face because she hasn't been able to see for over a month, not to be able to see her children, take, do her job, uh, be able to drive a car. But so she was very, very happy, except the contact lenses weren't very comfortable. So I wound up ordering, based on having her in my office, I could do a lot of tests. And based on the tests I was able to do, I was able to design a soft contact lens called Novacone for her. So that lens took about a week to come in. So she was struggling with the harder contact lenses for that week. They came in, she saw the same 2030, but they were much more comfortable and she was thrilled. After about two or three weeks, the eye kind of reshaped itself, even though the advice from the cornea specialist, who's a good friend of mine, said, keep out of contact lenses for six months. Do not let her wear any contact lenses. But she, and together with me, she insisted she couldn't, she couldn't live. She, you know, she couldn't see. She has to do something. So she wore the soft contact lenses, the specialty soft contact lenses. It somehow reshaped her eye. After about two or three weeks, she was able to go without contact lenses and be able to see again. And her vision was close to 2020. Really a miraculous story, secondary to specialty contact lenses. So, so define to us 
ex exactly what kind of material, how did specialty contact lenses get started, and do you have any stories like that? Yeah, well, I, I, unfortunately, or fortunately, depends how you look at it, I have many, 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 many stories like that. I've seen a lot of post-surgical complications, and it's kind of interesting when it comes to refractive surgery, whether we're talking about LASIK or PRK or, or even you know, back in the arcade days, um, basically I always tell patients, if someone's had refractive surgery and they've had an excellent outcome, they don't understand why everybody doesn't do refractive surgery. But if you speak to a person who's had a complication, and although they're today a low percentage, it still occurs, but those people can't understand why anybody would have refractive surgery. Of course, the truth is always in the middle, right? So yes, I've had many stories uh, uh, like yours uh, with your relative, the difference being that the vast majority of them don't get that miraculous reshaping uh, to excellence. A lot of them have permanent loss of vision without the use of specialty types of contexts. And you ask, what are specialty contexts? Uh, well, the truth is the definition of a specialty contact lens has evolved over the years. Um, back in the early days of, of my practice uh, and yours, since we worked together many years ago uh, back in New York, um, back in those days, just simply correcting astigmatism with a contact lens was considered a specialty contact lens. Today, it's considered a standard type of contact lens. So really today, when we say specialty contact lenses, we generally are referring to lenses that are addressing medical needs, those that are necessary after certain diseases of the cornea, for example, or after trauma to the eye or post-surgical uh, complications that we're relating to. Who develops specialty contact lenses? How are they developed? And what kind of materials are they made of? Sure. So if you really go back historically, uh, when contact lenses first became truly popular, they were all hard lenses. And anybody old enough to remember that or have parents or even grandparents uh, would realize that back in those days, like in the 50s and 60s, there were no soft contact lenses. There were only rigid contact lenses. Well, if you put a rigid contact lens on an irregularly shaped eye due to whatever reason that might happen, that corrects vision. So in essence, they were specialty contact lenses back then because they did that. They corrected normal vision, they corrected irregular vision. Uh, they were used for uh, different purposes. So we learned that applying a rigid lens to an irregularly shaped eye would mask, as we would call it, the irregularity of the front surface of the cornea, which is the most important focusing element of the eye. And when that happens, we're able to correct the vision for patients who out of glasses can't see well at all, and obviously without glasses can't either. So now we've developed a whole host of other types of lenses that in essence do that. You just referred to that when you fit the second lens to your uh, relative, that Nova cone that you related to is basically a soft contact lens that's designed with an extra thickness in the center to mask the irregularity sort of similar to what a rigid lens can do as well. And there are many different designs, and I'm sure today we'll talk about that together, that can do that. When these patients come in that have irregular corneas, they're very hard to get the prescription. We call that a refraction. How do you do that? So uh, first, let's just define the fact of what is a refraction. A refraction is a method by which we come up with the patient's vision prescription. In essence, what we put either in a pair of glasses or we convert it to a contact lens. There are two types of refractions that we do. One's called objective and one's called subjective. Objective uses a variety of instrumentation from simple to very complex and computer uh, generated uh, to give us, an, without the patient saying a word, just by looking into an instrument or having a light shining towards them, will give us an idea of that uh, element of their vision prescription. Subjective is something that everybody is familiar with who's had an eye exam. That's when the doctor puts you behind an instrument and starts changing lenses and says, which is better, one or two, three or four? And you say, I don't know. <laughs> Hopefully you do know, but uh, it, it is very frustrating for even normal vision patients. Well, try to do a subjective test like that on a patient with an irregular cornea who doesn't see well no matter what you put in front of their eye. It's extremely difficult, extremely frustrating for the patient 
yeah, honestly, frustrating for the doctor at times as well. And the way we try to get around that is making very large changes so they become obvious for the patient. And we do what's called a bracketing technique where we start with strong overcorrection lenses and then strong undercorrection lenses. And then we just bracket it down to get to the best point that we can. Well, getting back to the objective aspects, we're really developing wonderful objective uh, technology in uh, determining refraction. One of the things that we've been using over a good number of years now is a technique called aberrometry, which is an objective uh, way in which we can measure the way light focuses through the visual system. The beautiful thing about doing aberrometry, it really helps us identify where the visual challenge is coming from. Is it coming from the front surface of the eye, the front of the cornea, the tear film? Or is it coming from irregularity in the back of the cornea? Is it coming from opacities in the lens of the eye, like cataracts and things like that? So these new techniques not only are able to give us objective information, which is important in these cases, but also tells us where the problem is. So for example, let's say we do one of these tests and we realize that 99% of the problems coming from the front surface of the cornea being irregular. We know that by putting a specialty contact lens that can mask that irregularity, that patient should see dramatically better. Compare that to a patient who has both front surface and back surface significant irregularity or a cataract in addition to that. Well, those patients, we have to say, well, if we put a specialty contact lens on you, you'll see somewhat better, but it's not gonna be 100% or even close to that. And that's important to set realistic expectations, Carrie. So the cornea is the front part of the eye. Now in optometry, optometry is an amazing profession because we use such great technology. If you could talk about the different technology that you use and that we use as optometrists when we're evaluating somebody that needs a specialty contact lens. Absolutely. So let's start with the most basic. The most basic thing we want to do is first take a look at the eye and see physically, just by its, its appearance, what's going on. So we put a patient behind what we call a slit lamp or a biomicroscope that is in virtually every eye doctor's office. Uh, those of us who have uh, been there realize you put your chin into a chin rest and then there is a light, a fairly bright light that shines at the eye and a doctor's looking through these oculars. And there we can see what the surface of the eye looks like. Um, is there scarring of the cornea? Is there irritation on the surface of the eye? Is there a cataract? So on and so forth. We can look at the tear film and many other things. That's the most basic view. Now we'll get into a bit more advanced technology. And one of the most important in assessing for the application of specialty contact lenses is what we call topography of the cornea. And you alluded to that in the story with your um, relative before, when you said you looked at scans, you were talking about topography. Topography basically, uh, as we're all familiar with, is a measurement of the surface characteristics of a structure. In this case, we're talking about the cornea. The earliest types of um, abera uh, excuse me, the earliest types of topography were what we call placido-based topography, where we would shine these little rings onto the surface of the cornea. The computer in the instrument would measure the separation of the rings and the irregularity of the rings and give us a front surface kind of topography map, in essence, of the cornea, and tell us about that. Well, technology keeps advancing, and now we're into the world of tomography. Corneal tomography measures not only the front surface of the cornea, it measures the posterior back surface of the cornea, it measures the thickness of the cornea, and can even go deeper uh, into the, what we call the anterior segment of the eye. So it gives us a lot more information that helps us tease out where the problems are so that can gear us towards the most appropriate application and management, whether that be specialty contact lenses or otherwise. So a lot of times when we're looking at and using the Pentacam, we use a term called posterior float. Tell us what that means. So the Pentacam is a tomography instrument, which I was just relating to before. It's probably the most widely used. We use it in our practice, you do as well. Um, when we look at a measurement of the cornea from the Pentacam uh, tomographer, it will give us elevation or height map of the front of the cornea and the back of the cornea. So when we talk about posterior float that you related to, that relates to the irregularity of the height map or elevation map on the back of the cornea. And I know a lot of doctors now are using OCT, ocular coherence tomography. 
How can we use that to help us with specialty contact lens fitting? Ocular coherence tomography, OCT, can be divided into two general forms from the same instrument, by the way, as you know. Uh, retinal and optic nerve is posterior portion of the back portion of the eye. What we're talking about here is anterior segment optical coherence tomography, or ASOCT, which is amazingly uh, detailed in the imaging that we get. They're exquisite images uh, that we use in our practice. And now software is being developed to do the things that we were alluding to before in measuring the thickness across the surface of that cornea from one end to the other, the ability to measure elevation on the front and back of the cornea. Um, right now, technologically, these images are about as good as you can get, but the software that analyzes the anterior segment OCT images is still being developed and is really moving forward. And I expect over the coming years, the application of ASOCT to continue to grow. One of the areas we've been working with in terms of doing some clinical research and early adaptation is what we call epithelial thickness mapping of the cornea. And in certain corneal diseases, this is a problem. It is so uh, detailed in the imaging with ASOCT that you can actually measure the thickness of the what we would call the skin of the cornea, the surface layer called the epithelium. It's only a few cell layers thick, but we can actually measure them in microns of thickness and look for certain patterns in irregularity and look for changes over time uh, for progression of disease or the influence of treatments. And there's a variety of treatments to make some of these irregular corneas um, more stable and better. Okay, Barry, so tell me what posterior float is. That's a term that's used a lot by doctors who specialize in this area. Sure. Um, I alluded before to a technology called corneal tomography, which measures both the front and back surface of the cornea. So in those instruments, and the one that we use in our practice and probably the most commonly used worldwide is something called the Pentacam uh, corneal tomography system. Um, because it can measure the front and back of the corneal surface, it gives us maps or displays of elevation or height, both from the front and back. So when we look at the back surface of the cornea in terms of its elevation map, that's what we're talking about in terms of posterior float. In certain diseases like keratoconus, which we'll talk about more in a few minutes, I'm sure, um, we have an area of localized thinning of the cornea. And one of the first areas that gets affected is the back surface of the cornea that thins from the posterior to the anterior direction. So it's kind of like the Pillsbury Doughboy where you're pushing it from the back towards the front and it creates that little um, area of thinning. And posterior elevation, a little later in the disease, the front of the cornea starts. Now keep in mind that the influence on vision of the front of the cornea is much, much more dramatic than the influence on vision from the back of the cornea. So both do influence quality of vision and can cause distortion, but for the same degree of irregularity, a change on the front of the cornea is going to much more dramatically affect vision. Well, to a certain degree, that's fortunate because we can correct that with our specialty contact lenses. And the pentacam also helps us with the thickness of the cornea. How do we use right. that in fitting the contact lens? Yeah, so I'm not so sure I use corneal thickness for quote unquote fitting of the contact lens. It's more important in monitoring. Well, first, it's more important in diagnosis. So there are certain disease conditions that the, the overall thickness of the cornea becomes irregular and measuring it is fantastic in early detection. We could also look for progression of disease. But as it relates to a contact lens, we can look th at the influence of a contact lens on the corneal thickness. So it's not so much in you know, helping us get a measurement for what the contact lens should be. It's really more using the corneal thickness to make sure that the contact lens is not inducing what we call edema or thickening or even progressive localized thinning. The OCT, or ocular coherence tomography, is used now in the fitting and diagnosis of these type of cases. Explain both. So uh, OCT, optical coherence tomography, is an absolutely amazing technology. It first started 
to be utilized for the back of the eye in retinal diagnosis and management or optic nerve disease diagnosis and management, and it still is, and it's absolutely amazing. But modifications of the technology now allow us to image the front of the eye, the anterior segment of the eye, including the cornea. These images are exquisite and highly, highly detailed. So we can, with that technology, ASOCT, anterior segment OCT, measure the global thickness of the cornea. We can measure elevation on the front and back of the cornea and curvature. What is missing so far, but I don't think it's gonna be that way for a long time, is the software that can analyze and statistically give us information of what's normal and abnormal in those particular areas that's being developed and it will allow us to use those instruments at a much, much higher level. One of the areas that we've done some work with and research with is even the measurement of the front surface epithelial layer of the cornea, which is kind of like analogous to the skin over the cornea. It's only a few cell layers thick, but certain diseases show abnormalities in the distribution of thickness of that, only that layer, not the overall thickness, but just that layer. And we can measure it down to the micron level. It's pretty amazing technology. That's in terms of diagnosis of disease and monitoring for progression. But also, as you mentioned, anterior segment OCT is amazingly useful for contact lens analysis, specifically for what we call vaulting contact lenses. These are contact lenses that are fit that don't touch the cornea. They actually vault or are raised over the cornea with a fluid layer or a tear layer uh, beneath it. Those lenses actually come to land or rest on the white of the eye. One of the most popular types people have heard perhaps a bit about are called scleral lenses. These are lenses that are large diameter, the diameter of soft lenses or even a little bit larger, that are made of purely rigid, highly gas permeable material. They're amazingly comfortable uh, because they don't touch the cornea, which is very highly innervated by nerve endings. They actually land on the white of the eye or the sclera, which is not very sensitive. Now these lenses, again, vault the cornea. And with anterior segment OCT, we can measure how the lens vaults to make sure that it's vaulting fully, that it's not vaulting too much or too little, not bearing anywhere, and that it's landing on the sclera in a nice even pattern to make for what we would call an excellent scleral lens fit. There are also lenses called hybrid vaulting lenses. These are lenses that have a rigid center and a soft periphery, but they're designed to elevate over the cornea and we can use anterior segment OCT to evaluate those as well. Patients love when we show them those images and they can see the contact lens and the space between the contact lens and the front surface of the eye, the cornea, and then it really helps us explain it to them. Very much so. Um, a lot of these technologies, and I know in your office, you, you're very tech savvy, just like we are. That's why we're good buddies, one of the major reasons. But um, we bring in all of our technology into the exam room through our computer systems, right? So all of our instrumentation is networked so that we can not only evaluate them in front of the patient, but we can use them as educational tools. That's what you were alluding to, and they're very powerful. Now, can people with dry eye wear contact lenses? And sometimes we actually use specialty contact lenses to treat people with dry eyes. How does that work? That's correct. So dry eye is one of the most challenging uh, cases or diseases that we face in practice. Number one, it's so common. It's all over the place. And as people get older, dry eye is more common and gets more severe. Patients on certain medications, uh, have dry eye problems, patients who are in certain environments suffer as well. And as it relates to context, sometimes placing certain contact lenses can make dry eye more challenging, can make the symptoms even worse. However, with certain types of lenses, certain specialty lenses, we use them therapeutically. Getting back to the scleral lens that we were just talking about, because it has that tear layer or fluid layer behind the lens, when it's placed on the eye, there is a consistent bathing of the front of the eye with this fluid layer. And it really dramatically can improve both subjective symptoms of dry eye, as well as some of the physical findings that you and I see uh, when we examine patients. Let's talk about people that have very, very nearsighted. You know, we see, you know, most people, uh, you know, there's about 45 million people who wear contact lenses in the, in the US. But there's some people, they fall outside 
the normal curve where the where the contact lens companies can make a contact lens for them. Talk about what, what options do they have? So sure, and that's also a changing area. Um, up until a few years ago, if you were extremely nearsighted, very high numbers, let's say minus 14, minus 12, minus 10, you might not be able to be wearing what we would call conventional contact, like disposable contacts. Fortunately, the companies have expanded their manufacturing parameters to go higher and higher. And so mm, some of them now can actually even wear uh, disposable lenses. However, there are still a lot of people who suffer from extreme nearsightedness, you know, the minus 16s, the minus 18s. In the past, all we could do is prescribe rigid corneal uh, gas permeable contacts for them. But now there are numerous laboratories that fabricate customized soft lenses for them. And I alluded to other types like sclerals or hybrid lenses that we can also correct really high degrees of nearsightedness. Now remember, these patients are totally dependent on their contact lenses to see because their glasses are absurdly thick. Uh, and when they look anywhere off from the center in those glasses, things get distorted. So they are just for survival. When those patients have a pair of glasses, they're purely for survival. Normal function only is achieved with their, these type of contact lenses. You know, I've often thanked Cooper Vision because Cooper Vision is one of the companies that make a, will make a contact lens up to minus 20. And I've actually said, that I know you, you don't make a lot of money on those people over minus 12, but the fact that you make those contact lenses is really a wonderful thing that you do that. And they, they're really doing it for mankind. So we, a lot of times we'll have the companies behind us and help, really out there helping the, pa helping the patients. Yeah, I think, Carrie, you're going to see more and more companies. Cooper, thankfully, does that. Um, Bausch, Bausch and Lohm is getting into a specialty lens division where they're looking to take care of these more niche areas. And they realize these aren't big money makers for these companies, um, but they have a responsibility. They're in the vision correction business. And uh, thankfully, more and more of these companies are realizing that responsibility, and we're very thankful. How about patients that have irregular pupils? Talk about that. Irregular pupils can be a real challenge, and fortunately, specialty contact lenses often can help. So irregular pupil size or shape can be induced by a number of reasons. One could be something you're born with, congenital irregular pupils or certain diseases that cause irregularities of the pupil. Secondly, surgical. You can have certain eye surgeries that can result in irregular pupil size and shape. And third could be trauma to the eye. Regardless of the cause, these irregular pupils often induce a lot of glare symptoms, light sensitivity, and distortion of vision. So with specialty contact lenses, we can create artificial pupils. And we can do that in all sorts of lenses, in soft lenses, in, in um, scleral lenses, in a variety of different specialty lenses. We color the lenses or sometimes even hand paint them to, uh, and I don't hand paint them, the, the laboratories obviously do, um, uh, to create in essence an artificial pupil. And the impact that has uh, on patients' visual performance is amazing. I'll tell you a quick little story. You know, the side stories are always good. A number of years ago, a man was referred to me from one of the local hospitals. He had gone to downtown Chicago, went on a, a, a street called Rush Street. And you know Rush Street, Kerry, because you studied in Chicago for a while. Uh, Rush Street has a bunch of bars. And this guy was wearing glasses and he drank a little too much, and I don't know if he said the wrong thing to somebody or the other guy was dr more drunk. Well, he got punched right in the eye. The glasses shattered. It lacerated his cornea. It induced a, uh, an irregularity of the uh, iris. It caused a cataract. Surgeons had to go in, close up the laceration of the cornea. They actually had to remove his entire iris, remove the cataract, put an implant in there, but he had no iris. So he had an irregular cornea from the laceration. He was without an iris, so there was no aperture and an implant. It was the most bizarre thing to look at. So what we ended up doing is trying to address all of his needs. And I'm gonna to get to the, cut to the chase. This is what ended up happening. We developed a soft 
custom prosthetic colored contact with an artificial pupil that had a little recess in there that we could put a rigid corneal contact lens in that masked the irregularity of the corneal laceration scar. So that improved the quality of the anterior surface through the rigid contact, but the soft lens centered the rigid contact and also allowed us to create an artificial pupil that really immensely improved his visual function. Plus it also matched the color to his normal eye that wasn't damaged, which was hugely problematic because he had a sort of a hazily kind of color lens. And when he had no iris, it was black. Wow, the art of prosthetic contact lens fitting. Talk a little yeah. bit about more about prosthetic lenses, about people that may need those. Yeah, there's so many reasons uh, for prosthetic lenses. Um, I'll tell you, I think stories are always better than kind of lecturing what's out there. I'm gonna tell you another story uh, that's come full circle recently. Probably about eight years ago, a mom brings in a young uh, boy and he's about 12 or 13 years old at that time. He was out mowing the lawn with a lawnmower, no eye protection. The lawnmower must have hit a rock and it kicked a rock right up into his eye. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it caused a horrible trauma to his eye where his cornea became ill pacified. It virtually was white, okay? His vision was just light perception in that eye. Um, well, he was so self conscious at that age he started to grow his hair over that eye and kind of became what they call goth. So he came in, he's all in black, long black coat, his black dyed hair over his eye, his head down like this. And uh, we looked at him and it was more about cosmesis in that case. There was no way with, and there was no way you can get a corneal transplant because his entire cornea was, um, was opacified and vascularized. So this was for a cosmesis. We ended up fitting him in a prosthetic, hand-painted, customized contact to match the other eye. What we do is we take photographs of his normal eye, we send it to our specific specialty lab, they help us in developing the most proper match to the other eye. Well, what ended up happening was once we got him fit, a few months later, he came back in, his hair was cut. <laughs> he was like sitting up like this. You know, his whole personality had changed. And actually, he had come back in just over the past couple of months. It was great to see him again. And uh, he's like a new person, just like a new person. So there are so many reasons, as I said, post-trauma, uh, post-surgical complications, or congenital malformations uh, that you can improve with these prosthetic lenses, both in terms of cosmesis, how the eye looks, as well as, I told you in the first case, visual function. Wow, that's an, an amazing story, the, the power of optometry. So I have to ask you, since you, you brought that amazing story up, there are people online that are saying that they could give you an eye exam and that you don't need that puff of air in your eye, that, that horrible puff of air. What do you think about that? Well, uh, I, I think a couple of things, um, and I'm, I may or may not give you the answer you were <laughs> expecting. So I think currently today, technology is not there yet to do an automated refraction online. There are some systems that are being developed. I think they're missing a lot. Uh, surely uh, they do not replace the doctor's understanding of the case and how to manage it. It's, it, it's not objective like that. Um, disease diagnosis and management but even giving you the best prescription possible, we're not there yet. On the other hand, I'm a firm believer in technology, and whenever technology is challenged in our world today, somehow we come up with an answer. So do I think at some point there'll be some object of maybe online systems that can give us a really, really good prescription? I think someday that's probably gonna happen. But when it comes to disease diagnosis, I think that AI or artificial intelligence is also going to be amazingly effective. So you still need the human element to take this data and know what to do with it. You can't replace that element. And that's why I think you and I will have jobs until we're ready to play a lot of golf. Macular degeneration is a leading cause of vision loss, with 15% of Americans being at risk or already affected. Scientific evidence proves that by using mesozeaxanthin,
lutein, and zeaxanthin together replenishes the macular pigment and promotes healthier vision. This formula comes in only one product, MacuHealth. So let's talk about multifocal contact lenses. I know you're an expert in that area. You lecture a lot about it. Are people, do they really work? Do people do well with them? Are they the gas permeable ones, the harder ones, or the soft ones? Which ones are the best? So the answer is they're all wonderful. They all work and they all don't work. So it's all very patient dependent. I also think that practitioner experience and knowing how to apply the various designs is very, very critical. My teeth were cut so to speak, in uh, multifocal contact lens fitting with corneal gas permeable rigid uh, multifocals. I learned that earlier on in my career and I had to learn it through the School of Hard Knocks uh, in how to fit these lenses properly and how to apply the optics properly. Uh, today, there are just so many more designs out there that work so much better. But here's, here's the rub. Almost, not all, but almost all of them are what we call simultaneous vision multifocals, which means light focusing for near and distance and intermediate or mid-range are all focusing on the eye at the same time. And our brain's perceptual system has to select what it wants to attend to. So the optics are always to a certain degree compromised somewhat. Some people are very sensitive to that and just don't do well in the multifocal lenses and other patients just seem to tolerate it and do very well. So you could have two patients wearing the same multifocal, reading the same degree on the eye chart, 2020 far and 2020 near. Patient A thinks it's horrible and patient B thinks it's the greatest thing since sliced bread. Uh, but once again, knowing the nuances on how to modify the parameters of lenses is very very critical to success. Well, there are a lot of standard multifocal designs out there, uh, even disposable soft lens designs out there, where you really cannot modify the parameters very, very much. It's either they're going to work or they're not going to work to a certain degree. But when you get into specialty, as I would call them, specialty contact lenses, uh, you have a lot more parameters that the doctor can modify, whether it's the zone size for either distance or near or the powers. There are so many different things that you can work on to increase your success likelihood. And that's why I think certain practitioners fail at achieving success with patients because they only use the most basic types of designs. And when they don't work, they say to the patient, well, you can't wear multifocal contact lenses. That's not fair in my judgment. I think the right statement is, as far as I can go, this is far, as far as we can do. But if you really are motivated, maybe let's see if we can find a colleague who really specializes in this area and do a good referral. Now, the average person, how many lenses do you think they have to uh, try on or test before they get the prescription that they feel comfortable with? Well, I think in the hands of an experienced practitioner, you should be able to hit it in two lenses in, in most cases. There are exceptions to that. Um, you know, we have a pretty high first lens selection success rate, but surely with two lenses, we get well over 90%. Uh, then the rest have to go for more. And, you know, I will always tell our patients that I'll go as far as they have the patience to go until I feel like nothing more can be done. So I have some patients where I've made four and five changes, but they've been willing to go through the time and effort and expense to do that. So let's talk about the difference between daily disposable contact lenses, uh, monthly, two-week, uh, multifocal contacts. What's your preference? Well, I think if we are all honest with each other, um, as a patient and as a practitioner, if everything else is equal, why wouldn't you want a daily disposable lens, right? Um, and when I say everything else is equal, the cost, the uh, parameters, and how we can prescribe. Currently, in multifocals, in daily disposables, we have more and more designs coming out, but it's still relatively limited. I cannot do uh, what I need to do for a lot of my patients in what's available currently in a daily disposable, but I still can take care of a lot of people. Uh, daily disposables, as a patient, as, as if I were wearing lenses, why wouldn't I want that? I put a fresh lens on every single day. It's surely the healthiest way to wear lenses, most comfortable. 
Um, I think the only challenge that I could see is its impact on the environment, but we're addressing that too, as you know. We're starting to recycle both the lenses and the packaging, and that's really important. So who's a good candidate for these type of contact lenses? In multifocals, are we speaking? Yeah, multifocals. Yeah, in good candidate for multifocal. Well, I'm gonna tell you a bad candidate, um, and that is the pickiest engineer you can ever pick or find, right? The guy who, when I make one little click in the instrument in subjective refraction, he, he may have a heart attack. Um, so ultra sensitive, ultra visually critical people may not do well because they require precision of vision that may not be achieved with current multifocal technology. Let me take it to the next level. I talked about simultaneous vision lenses. I wanna talk about the future for just a second. It's not available yet, but it's really exciting. And that relates to what we call smart contact lenses. And in presbyopic correction, multifocal correction, we are developing lenses that have electronics in there that actually through liquid crystal changes the power of the lens from seeing far to seeing near. So you no longer have simultaneous vision because when you look far, that contact lens is focused only for far. When you look near, the contact lens is only focused for near. It's still in development. Uh, how that change occurs, is it a certain number of blinks? Is it direction of gaze? Is it hitting yourself on the side of the head? We don't quite know yet. Um, and there's challenges, but I've seen some of the prototypes. It's amazingly exciting. Which companies are working on that? Well, uh, there are a number. I know that uh, Alcon has been working on one. J&J &J has been working on one. I wouldn't be surprised at others as well. With multifocal contact lenses, how important is lighting and pupil size? Yeah, so lighting is critical. Um, you know, a, a good friend of mine, uh, who you know from our New York days, um, whose name is Ken Landsman, you know Kenny, uh, once told me, he tells his patient, light is your friend <laughs> when it comes to multifocals. And I've always used his, uh, his, his statement about that. And the fact that, and I show patients, even in the exam room, will take that good direct lighting and put it on a reading thing and they see it beautifully. Now I just take it off and I say, see what happens? So I said, you may have some trouble in a dim, dimly lit room. Uh, I used to say in a dimly lit restaurant, but they don't have to worry about that for a little while. Uh, but, um, right, unfortunately. But light is very, very important. Pupil size becomes very important, especially in more of the specialty lenses where we can control the various zone sizes that are dedicated to far, to near, to intermediate. So um, we can actually manipulate those zone sizes based upon patient's pupil uh, diameters. It's just amazing what can be done with contact lenses now that people, you know, probably 80% of the people are successful with soft multifocal contact lenses. And people, people love wearing them. I mean, they rather wear multifocal contacts and wear their glasses any day. They're much more, they're much happier. Even athletes, you know, the weekend warriors, they love to wear their contacts. I play softball and two different softball leagues. I, haven't, I even have friends and patients who play ball that wear multifocal contacts. And I would think it would bother them maybe, you know, maybe the vision a little bit, but not at all because they're out in the bright light and they could, they could see good and they're, they're happy with how they see. I agree. And you know, uh, one thing we didn't mention that for so many years and even up till today, most eye doctors, when they're faced with presbyopia or the patients who need help up close, they go in context to monovision which is one contact lens that sees far away and one contact lens that sees near. Now, does it work? Yeah, it kind of works. Um, there are definite compromises there. But what I say to both patients and to doctors when I speak to them about multifocal contact lenses is, if you had your druthers, would you want one eye for far and one eye for near? We weren't meant to be that way. Yes, there are certain patients who are born with one nearsighted eye and one farsighted eye, but that's surely the rare exception. We were designed to be binocular, two eyes working together. So why wouldn't you first try to see if you can be successful in a multifocal before going to monovision? That's our approach. I think that's your approach as well, Kerry. It is, and absolutely. If you could use both eyes, and you know, we always use, we don't even go to monovision anymore. We 
we go right to the multifocus, more fitting contact lenses. Now let's talk about your favorite subject, keratoconus. What is keratoconus? How long, how long ago did you start the keratoconus organization? And tell us a little bit about that organization. Sure, I, I really appreciate that. Keratoconus is kind of my little area of um, passion. Um, and it surely blends in with specialty contact lenses so well, of course. So keratoconus is what we call a corneal ectasia or an irregularity of the cornea. It is a naturally occurring hereditary disease. We now know that the genetics play a huge part in it. In fact, just this year, the first commercially available genetic screening test for keratoconus came to market. And we've been doing some consulting uh, in that area and actually um, helped provide some data early on in, in that test development. So patients who have this genetic uh, predisposition will develop over time irregularity and localized thinning of the cornea. This results in distortion of vision. We now know that it starts quite early in life as we're developing technologies that are much more sensitive at picking them up. Um, the statistic that's been thrown around for years and years and years of its prevalence and how common is it in the population, like one in 2000, came from a study decades ago using very, very old technology. If we're looking at some of the newer studies going on, those numbers are much higher. A study out of the Netherlands a couple of years ago um, using more advanced technology for diagnosing keratoconus came up with a prevalence rate of one in 375 people. Um, amazingly common. This condition is very, very common. We now also have treatments that can stop it from progressing. So if we can diagnose it early on before it has a dramatic negative impact on vision, apply these treatments to stop its progression, what can happen? We preserve vision. That's, that's the mantra that our organization, the International Keratoconus Academy of Eye Care Professionals has. That's, that's, that's our mission statement. To move forward within the eye care profession, the ability to understand what the state of the art and our understanding of diagnosis and treatment and management of this condition is. So IKA, as we call it, International Keratoconus Academy, was formed now probably, I'm not quite sure if it's up to five years, four or five years ago, uh, by myself and a group of other people who have special interest in keratoconus. And we now have in our membership well over 600 uh, eye doctors from throughout the world. And these eye doctors are optometrists, ophthalmologists, and other allied eye care uh, professionals. And we share information and one of the most exciting things be, be beyond sharing information and all the lectures and writing that our group does is we're now, um, we have undertaken a study of the prevalence in a pediatric population of keratoconus, which is really exciting. We've now screened well over 2000 school age kids in the Chicago public school system. And we are now analyzing data uh, for these people. And we can tell, I can't give you numbers yet because we're still in the analysis phase, but we can tell that the prevalence of this condition in this population is going to be quite high. And that really makes us aware that we have to be thinking about this when we see kids in terms of routine screening for the disease. There's a new concept called epigenetics. So it's genetics plus. What else is a contributing factor to keratoconus in in addition to genetics. Yes, I love that term epigenetics because more and more we're realizing that the expression of a disease is not only based on the pure DNA that's there. The expression of the disease can be influenced by the environment uh, and other factors that really influence that. So in keratoconus, probably the single most impactful element is eye rubbing. So people have always known that eye rubbing is bad for keratoconus. Some people thought that it causes keratoconus. I don't believe that at all. I believe that keratoconus is a genetically predisposed condition. However, based on epigenetics, the influence of that manual deep eye rubbing um, can cause the disease to progress and become worse for sure. How about hormonal changes? The hormones have anything to do with it? The endocrine. Yeah, I think that 
I think that that has influences as well. We see changes sometimes during pregnancy and all sorts of things like that. I would tell you, we uh, have more that we don't know than we do know when it relates to this. And I think the, the story is just that we have to keep an open mind because there are a lot of closed minds out there and there are some people who are just saying, no, it's caused by this and it's not caused by that. Well, more we're learning. Um, and even the genetics of keratoconus, it's not like the genetics that you, you, most of us learned in high school, Mendelian genetics, where you had a big X and a little X and you had you know, the Punnett squares, if anybody remembers that from high school um, biology. Uh, it's very complex, multiple alleles, multiple genetic combinations. Um, so even the genetics themselves are very complicated. Add to that the epigenetic elements. It, it's a very complex thing for sure. So tell me about the IKA. If people who want to find out more about keratoconus, what should they do? Yeah, so, you know, the origins of the organization are really kind of interesting. Um, myself and, as, as I mentioned, a few other uh, really key people in this area, we're always talking about the fact of how much misinformation there was out there within the eye care professional field. I'm not talking about out in the lay public. I'm talking about eye doctors and how so many people were being, in essence, mismanaged, unfortunately, um, on both ends, from the optometric end, from the ophthalmological end. I, as I've always said, uh, you know, back in those days, um, optometrists would fit contact lenses until they scarred the cornea and then they finally would get a transplant. And ophthalmologists, unfortunately, would be doing transplants maybe earlier on, thinking that patients weren't contact lens tolerant when they just didn't see the right optometrist to fit them properly. And of course, as always, the truth lies in between. So out of that formed IKA. And um, basically, this is an organization geared towards eye care professionals rather than the lay public. We have sort of a sister organization that I've worked with and done consulting with called the National Keratoconus Foundation, NKCF. That is an organization that is geared towards giving patients and the families of patients with keratoconus more information. So um, we have a website. The uh, website for IKA is keratoconusacademy.com, www.keratoconusacademy.com. And NKCF is also uh, online. And those uh, who are interested in learning more can go to the NKCF website. Just put it in your Google and their website will come up. I think it's nkcf.org, but I'm not quite sure. But if you put it in for your search engine, you'll come up with it. Very early, very early keratoconus. What is that called? And when do you start treating it? And how do we treat it? Well, that surely is a changing landscape. Uh, because very early keratoconus is defined by the diagnostic uh, tools that you have. Um, today, with corneal tomography, with anterior segment OCT, and also one area that we've done some work with that we didn't mention is called corneal biomechanical measurements. So we have an instrument in our office that measures the rigidity of the cornea. And we're seeing cases where topography tomography, anterior segment OCT are all normal, but their corneal biomechanics are abnormal. And these patients are at risk for developing keratoconus as well. So as our technologies diagnostically are getting more and more sensitive, we're able to detect this disease earlier on. Well, let's kind of blend that in with treatment. So those who are kind of keeping up in keratoconus have heard of a treatment called corneal cross-linking. We apply riboflavin or vitamin uh, B derivative in, in liquid form to the cornea. We shine a UV light for a period of time and the corneal structure stiffens or cross-links. And at a very high rate, upper 90%, the corneas don't progress in keratoconus. Early forms uh, of uh, cross-linking uh, and those that are currently FDA approved require the removal of that surface skin of the cornea called the epithelium. Well, this results in a slower recuperation of vision um, to a certain degree, not a high percentage, uh, potentially a higher rate of infection and some discomfort. It's still extremely accurate. It's extremely effective. Um, and for the most part, it's, its safety profile is really excellent. Um, however, it 
it, because patients sometimes have to be out of context for a significant period of time, uh, that can be challenging. We're developing newer technologies where we don't have to remove the epithelium of the cornea. And that holds great promise. Those are, those are going through clinical studies that are uh, going to apply for FDA approval. And they expect that at a certain point that we'll get some good outcomes from that. So the point being that we have a treatment that is relatively low risk that can stop its progression. So if we can diagnose this disease early on before vision is significantly compromised, apply these, these treatments appropriately, uh, then we could preserve patient's vision. And to be honest with you, maybe they're putting me a little bit out of business to a certain degree, because if we do this in mass numbers, maybe they won't need those specialty contacts that I've been fitting over all these years. And that would be fine by me. Now, when somebody needs cross-legging, do we need to wait for a change or do we just see any form of keratoconus and refer them for cross-legging? So I think um, as far as FDA approved methods, by the definition, it says it's for application of progressive keratoconus. So you have to, you have to, to document progression to meet those FDA criteria. But I happen to know without a doubt that lots of physicians who are treating these with cross-linking, these cases with cross-linking, if they think a patient is at high risk for progression, I'll define that in a moment, they will do that um, without necessarily documenting progression. That would be an off-label use. It's not according to the FDA guidelines, but they would feel that it's, it's ethically the right thing to do. An example, let's say you have a mom who's um, you know, 47 with moderately advanced keratoconus, but it's stable and it's been stable for the last few years. And they have a child who's now 10, 12 years old. Our early technology picks up keratoconus in the patient, but still correctable in regular glasses to 2020. Are you going to wait for that vision to become distorted before you're going to treat with cross-linking? You have a family history, you have a documented early diagnosis, that person at that age is at really high risk for progression. So in my mind, ethically, I would recommend cross-linking for that patient. Take another patient, and I see this all the time, patient referred into me to manage them with contact lenses for keratoconus, and they're 55 years old. Uh, they're just not seeing well out of their uh, soft contact lenses. Well, I see that they have moderate keratoconus, I can treat them very well with specialty contact lenses, but their likelihood for progression is very low at that age. So as a person gets older, their likelihood of progression goes down. And I generally, my guideline, this is just mine and everybody's different. If you're under 30, in my mind, you are at high risk for progression. If you're between 30 and 45, it's kind of 50-50. Over 45, over 50, you're much less likely to progress than not progress in, in my experience. And so those patients that I am not convinced are at high risk for progression, I'm going to monitor them. And depending upon their age will tell me how often I should monitor them. And I would apply cross-linking for the older person if I documented progression, but I wouldn't unless I documented that progression in that age group. So with all the new technology, we're going to pick up a lot of people with keratoconus. You know, at one time it was one in 2,000, at one time it was one in 10,000. Now it's one in one, 350. Now we're picking up on the topography because we're doing topography on everybody. So we have these early signs of keratoconus. How do we know not to jump the gun that we start referring all these patients for uh, cross-linking? Yeah. So you have to be able to differentiate true keratoconus from pseudo-keratoconus, which is way beyond our conversations today. But sometimes it, a referral from a primary eye care provider who is maybe not as experienced in keratoconus to another more specialized provider can help in making that differential diagnosis of true versus you know, pseudo-keratoconus. So that is very important. You bring up a critically important point, uh, Kerry, and that is having the technology available to screen for this condition. Well, just measuring corneal topography, the front surface of the cornea, which is the most common method in eye care offices today, is going to have, unfortunately, a decent number of false positives and false negatives. False positives mean, I think it's keratoconus, but it really isn't. And false negatives 
are cases where I missed keratoconus based upon that corneal topography because I didn't measure the back of the cornea or I didn't measure the distribution of thickness across the cornea, which changes in advance of the front surface shape of the cornea. So I think we need to work on technologies that are more sensitive at picking up keratoconus, but are affordable and applicable uh, to primary eye care doctors' offices. Uh, and different companies are doing that, to be honest with you. So I wouldn't be surprised in the next five to 10 years, we're gonna see dramatic uh, improvements in our ability to diagnose uh, keratoconus earlier. And I think outcomes from studies like our IKA study on pediatric prevalence will push industry to do that because they're going to realize this is out there and we need to address it. Have you been seeing a lot of it in kids? Not to give yeah. it away, but... Well, the truth is the numbers are pretty staggering. And when we're ready to come out with our uh, first reports, which hopefully will be over the next few months, I think everybody will be really surprised. And I got a feeling, and not only will we see this coming out in the professional literature, but I think uh, some lay pu publications, general public uh, information will pick up on this for making people more aware of this condition. Talk about contact lenses for keratoconus, the different, the different types. So basically there are all types. And it used to be thought that only corneal hard lenses can be used for keratoconus. It used to be thought that. In fact, I've done um, patient um, lectures for National Keratoconus Foundation where there can be 150, 200 patients and their families in an audience with keratoconus. And I would ask the, um, I would ask the audience, I said, how many of you in the audience were told by your eye doctor, you have keratoconus, so you have to wear hard contact lenses? Raise your hand. And I would say 95% of the of the audience would raise their hand. That's changing now, thankfully, because there's a whole array of contact lenses that can correct keratoconus, from standard soft lenses for the most mild cases, all the way up to corneal rigid lenses. But let's just review what they may be. So once we get a cornea that the front surface is distorted enough that standard contact lenses just don't cut the mustard, glasses don't cut the mustard, we still can use soft lenses. You alluded to that way at the beginning of our talk. There are soft keratoconic specialty designs out there. These designs use specialized thickness profiles to mask irregularity and shape profiles on the front and back of the contact lens to minimize some of the distortions or aberrations. And we can fit a whole heck of a lot of keratoconics very well, providing really good vision, really good comfort with these specialty soft lenses. That's number one. Number two are hybrid contacts. We alluded to that earlier. Rigid center, soft skirt, or soft periphery. And those lenses, because of the rigidity of the central portion, also can mask the irregularity. Um, scleral lenses are expanding in their use throughout the world um, because they provide excellent vision, excellent comfort, uh, really an answer to a lot of people's problems. Scleral lenses are large diameter, all rigid material, highly oxygen permeable, but vault over the surface of the cornea. Then we have our corneal rigid lenses that have been used for years and years, and they still work very, very well. Um, add to that something that I know you and I are very uh, excited and use a lot is called piggybacking or tandem contact lens fitting. That is where we'll use a very thin, highly oxygen permeable soft lens, usually a disposable, often today a daily disposable, and then put the corneal rigid lens over the surface. What's the advantage? One, comfort. Comfort is dramatically improved. Two, protection. That soft lens creates kind of like a bandage to the surface of the eye, so the rigid lens is not causing any mechanical irritation. And sometimes, not often, but sometimes we can manipulate that soft um, carrier lens thickness-wise to help center the gas permeable to provide better optics. So tandem use or piggybacking use is another way. So that kind of covers <laughs> all the areas. So there's lots of options for keratoconus. I love piggyback contact lenses. They're really cool. It's really, it's really something. But I got to ask you this question. If somebody comes into your office and they're a new, they're new keratoconus, and if we put us for the audience, put it on a scale of one to 10, where 10 is really, really bad, and one is very mild, and it's like a six or a seven. What's your first lens that you're thinking of, of fitting? What type? 
So it, it is a little bit more complicated because it depends upon what kind of seven that is. You know, a seven where the apex of the cone, the, the center of the keratoconus is smack in the center can be a very good hybrid lens candidate. Um, a seven who has an apex of the cone that's really inferiorly decentered, I'm uh, going to often use a scleral lens because even corneal GPs may not center properly to provide good op optics. So it's a little complicated. Sorry to put you on the spot like that. But that's a, you're, you're, you're one of the world experts in keratoconus, so I had, I had to ask you about that. So well, let's, let's, let's move. Is there anything else you want to add about keratoconus that we haven't talked about? I think we've covered a, a great amount. And again, I just encourage uh, any of the people out there um, who have more interest to, to contact uh, IKA or NKCF. They're great resources. One thing we didn't talk about, what are the symptoms of keratoconus? What are the symptoms the patients have? Well, of course, due to the distortion, most of their symptoms are visual. They'll get multiple images out of one eye, like you know, double, triple, quadruple vision. They'll have a lot of um, kind of streaming of lights and halos. They get blur. They just don't see clearly. It's distorted. Um, there are a number of social media, quote unquote, face group groups for patients with keratoconus. I learned so much by voyeuring on those uh, websites. Because we as eye doctors spend a few minutes, maybe once or twice a year with these patients, and we think we know them. We don't know them. We don't know what their life is like. All you have to do is go on those uh, websites or Facebook groups and listen to the experience that these people live through and how it impacts their lives. It's absolutely, you know, heart-wrenching, to be honest with you. And what do the doctors see when we look at a patient with keratoconus? What could happen to their eye from mild to moderate? So in the most or mild scary. cases, in the most mild cases, if you look under the microscope, they look like normal corneas. You don't see anything. There are slit lamp or biomicroscopic findings that develop as the disease gets uh, more significant, uh, all the way up to scarring of the cornea. How you really pick it up is a number of ways in a general eye doctor's office. Um, we often will measure either topography or what we call keratometry, where we get a basic idea of the smoothness of the front surface of the cornea, um, and we'll see distortions develop there. Um, we'll see significant changes in prescription that are atypical for that, you know, that age group, where their astigmatism in one eye just goes up dramatically in one year big differences between the two eyes, things that don't make sense. Those should be red flags for eye doctors and for patients as well. I've had patients, in fact, just a couple of weeks ago, I had a new keratonic patient referred to me. And fortunately, their primary doctor realized it and referred the patient to me for contact lens management and disease management. However, that was the first time that patient saw that eye doctor had been to other eye doctors for years and years, and nobody told them about keratoconus, and they were telling me that like every six months their prescription was changing. That doesn't happen like that, especially in astigmatism, and they couldn't understand why it was happening so unusually and so frequently. So these are red flags that all of us need to be very sensitive to. I want to thank Dr. Barry Iden for joining me today. He's such a wealth of information. Dr. Iden, if somebody wants to find you, how can they do that? Yes, so I think the best way is to uh, find me through our website uh, at North Suburban Vision Consultants. Uh, we're located in Deerfield, Illinois, which is a northern suburb of the Chicago area. So our website is www.nsvc.com. And there's a lot of information on all the topics we talked about uh, today. And I would welcome anybody to reach out. And I greatly appreciate that opportunity, Carrie. Thank you for today, it was great. Thank you for joining me, you are fantastic, such a wealth of information. Uh, you were always a mentor to me and it's just great to be able to talk to you one-on-one. -on -one. Mutual Admiration Society, you know that, my brother. Well, this is Dr. Kerry Gelb for Open Your Eyes. Until next time, thank you. Since I bought Safe For You, my dad makes me clean his boat. It's natural y es un buen producto. Every time I go back to school, my mom always makes sure that I have my Safe For You products. I like to bring extra, and my roommates certainly don't mind. It's a good thing I had Safe For You to clean up after this little guy. 
When my hands get dry, I like to wash them with Safe For You. And most importantly, the reason why I buy Safe For You is because it's safe for me and you.